All right, guys, what is going on? This is Minute Mateo. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, things are going on in the world. I'm going to scare you guys today. I'm going to spook you guys out. I'm going to spread that FUD. And we're going to spread some darkness at the speed of light here today. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Let me turn my Twitter off. Goodness gracious. Am I addicted to that? It's really unfortunate. I was at peace a couple months ago. And then, because the call to action, the call to wild, the call to adventure to the internet, which is, I guess, the adventure nowadays. It's not going out and wrestling bears like they do in Uzbekistan or whatever. Where, where does that uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov guy come from? You know, the Dagestani guy. He's Russian. He's Russian. Yeah. We're not like those guys. Whenever we want to go on an adventure, like we pop up in like RuneScape or World of Warcraft or something. You know, we start battling dragons. But, you know, uh, I guess we're going to start battling real dragons here pretty soon if China continues to uh, expand and be belligerent and unfriendly. And unfriendly. And then we're going to talk about China a little bit today. But, um,. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to spread FUD. Before we get into the video, we've got some things to talk about. And um, it might be a little bit concerning, but I just want to give you actionable intelligence. I'm not trying to spook anybody out. I'm not trying to, you know, spread anything to be concerned about. Because, again, we like to stay at peace here, sort of like with the Evergrande videos. If you guys watch those videos, you were ahead of the curve. If you didn't freak out, if you didn't panic, if you hedge properly, yeah, you were able to make some money and you were able to make out pretty nicely. Um, or at least save yourself some money, right? I mean, I don't know who made money. It was kind of a pan sell off situation. That's what happens when people get scared. But I think that some of you made some pretty good decisions. Good for you. Uh, we're going to do market updates on that coming up. But with this, I do want to do the same thing. And this is going to tie into our thesis here on this channel that crypto isn't the greatest store of value. Uh, we like to see it as a medium of exchange. I think that's the most accurate way to approach crypto because we're talking about accounting ledgers here. We're talking about digits and bits of information on a screen at the end of the day. That's what they are. It's a way to determine who owes who what, who owns what in society. This is all well and good, but at the end of the day, it's just information. Okay. And if there are problems with the electricity grid, if there are problems with the internet infrastructure, if there are regulations which come down, which make it hard for you to access certain cryptocurrencies, which we're going to talk in, about in another video. But again, there are many different vectors of attack um, on this idea that crypto is a store of value. Um, it's a medium of exchange. I think it's an optimal medium of exchange to silver and gold and to fiat. You know, you don't have some crazy lunatic power drunk third parties printing this stuff into oblivion, right? And... You know, I guess they're not going to have to print in the future. They'll just tally it up on a keyboard and send it out to people, which we talked about in yesterday's video. But it could be that uh, there are issues with that. You want to hedge that with gold and silver and some commodities and maybe some uh, some real stuff, some real stuff, right? So we're going to talk about that today. Let's go ahead and get into the content. Remember, guys, to like the video and share it when you're done if you liked it and subscribe. Check out our social media. Check out the donation links below. Let me see where we are. Oh, this is a good interview with that Snipes guy. <laughs> no, what's his name? Uh, Wesley Thies. <laughs> I say Snipes. Wesley Snipes. That's a name in my head. I forgot who that guy even was. Anyways, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with the internet in electricity infrastructure around the world because you need this stuff for crypto to work. And if there are risks to that, then you're not going to have a great time. It's sort of like that South Park episode. Do the pizza or you're not going to have a great time. <laughs> and so you're going to want to do the pizza by maybe getting yourself some exposure outside of crypto because I know some people are kind of loony. You know, They got all their assets in crypto. Not the greatest idea. Get some real stuff. Get some real stuff. Or just enjoy your life, right? Don't, uh, you know, sit in your dark, dungy basement, dingy basement, and just, uh, you know, rack up sats. It's not the right way to go about it. Anyways, so here we go. Holly Mistowski. After internet blackout today in Melbourne, Australia, I have a serious question. How do we communicate if the internet is taken out? How do we mobilize? We need to plan ahead. Well, even a better question, Holly, is... How are you going to trade your cryptos? How are you going to uh, be able to get together with the crypto bros? That is one serious question, right? And 
this is not an isolated incident. And I hear that some people, they don't really uh, know if there was a blackout. Some people are like, well, I'm in Melbourne. We didn't have a blackout. What internet blackout? I live in Melbourne. Didn't experience any. Let's see if there are any replies. Bot alert. <laughs> well, they think they're bots. Look at the Hong Pro. Look at the Hong Kong protests for inspiration. They use decentralized encrypted messaging apps. So I guess there's an internet thing going on in Hong Kong too when the Hong Kong protests were happening. People were talking about ham radios. Uh, cell phones and internet will not be reliable. Uh, it will be used against you. And we looked at this with Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. They're talking about cyber polygon. Surely you guys have heard of that. We've referenced that in different videos, but uh, basically Klaus Schwab is like, oh, the, uh, the bug problem is going to be nothing. It is not going to be nearly severe compared to what is coming next. And, you know, he's talking about the Internet going out and, uh, you know, virus. Can I say that? Viruses, yeah, going through the digital landscape rather than the biological landscape. They think that is going to become an issue, and you know they're pointing fingers at the Ruskies and everything like this, right? But anyways, that's a threat coming in the future, internet blackouts. And this isn't just relevant to Hong Kong and on uh, Australia. This is a Wired article here by Gian Volpicelli, an Italian friend of ours. The draconian rise of internet shutdowns, right? So we see the stage being set for this kind of thing to happen. And this was written back on the 2nd of September this year, so pretty relevant. Ten years on from the Arab Spring, internet shutdowns are increasingly being used to stifle democracy. But what comes next could be worse. Um, do people still believe we have democracy? Is that still a thing? That's interesting. Um, okay, so here, when Lou woke... Up early on February 1st, he noticed that his Wi-Fi had stopped working. And he couldn't get into his crypto, right? He turned his router off and on again. Nothing changed. There was no internet. Worse, it now looked like his smartphone couldn't get online either. And I see the crypto bros, they share these articles. And they're like, oh, isn't that terrible? And it's just like they don't reference how this is bad for crypto. <laughs> like, I don't see that anywhere. Like, we're going to get to this story in a little bit, and we went over the story before, but it's like Michael Saylor, he looked at what was going on in Lebanon, he's just like, yeah, get Bitcoin, guys, get Bitcoin. And first off, they weren't even able to hear Michael Saylor because they weren't able to get onto the internet because they didn't have electricity, <laughs> right? So they couldn't hear Michael Saylor saying, get Bitcoin, but even if they did get Bitcoin, it really wouldn't be worthless, or it really wouldn't be worth anything, right? So... Yeah, this electricity isn't working here. Back to the article. Yeah, but, 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 but this is so strange. What happened? Well, the military took over the comp uh, country. He's in Myanmar. Uh, he's in Yangon, which is the capital of Myanmar. And yeah, they had their country taken over and they shut off the internet. And when you shut off the internet, you prevent people from being able to coordinate. And I suspect that's probably something which is going to come in the future as a hedge against any further populist uprisings. Because one thing that was interesting about the whole bug situation is that if you look at what was happening in 2019 with the rise of the Jeanne Brons or whatever they're called in France with the yellow vest, excuse me, if you look at the Hong Kong protests, if you look at the rise of Trump, it was a populist movement going on worldwide. Brexit also. And there was an initiative to overthrow the new liberal world order. Like, that's what was happening. And so this thing comes out of left field. And then all of a sudden, two years later, after uh, lockdowns, after, uh, you know, these mail-in voting uh, initiatives being introduced into elections, which if that didn't happen, I mean, despite what you think, that would have change the election totally and we're not going to get into all that but it's true it's true um and again we're not going to get into all that you can do your research on that come to your own opinions but i think it changed a lot right and so there was a lot that happened and also of course you know a lot of people who are not bent uh a lot of populists who don't want to go along with the whole program and i'm trying to watch my language here that's why i'm kind of like sputtering out but like they are losing their jobs now they are losing prominent positions. They're not being uh, allowed to go on for certain promotions. They're purging the military ranks. This is another important thing that's happening. They're saying that if you don't get the medical procedure, you are getting 
kicked out of the military. You are not allowed to be in a position of leadership in the military. And this is going on throughout the government. This is going on throughout corporate America. And so it's sort of a power consolidation move that this is now turning into, which is fascinating, right? And so... Um, <laughs> and and so it's interesting that that was used in order to prevent the populace from taking over because now the working class, now the people who were getting a leg up on the liberal world order have been put back into their place, right? And now they're rolling out these programs like we talk about all the time on the channel. You got to have passports, you got to have digital IDs, you got to uh, probably take on the central bank digital currency and the mark of the beast if you want to become part of the new economic system that they're rolling out, right? Which a lot of people aren't going to go along with, which means they're going to lose uh, economic opportunities. And, you know, they're not even coming out to vote anymore. You look at the California recall. Uh, the working class has just been dispirited. They've been uh, hollowed out. And so, uh, yeah, it's it's looking pretty grim for those guys. But if they ever get uppity again, I imagine what's going to happen is they're going to shut off the Internet. I think that's what's going to happen. I think they're going to shut off the Internet, and then they'll bring in, like, the U.N. Army or whatever uh, globalist force and lock things down and prevent that from happening. Now, I'm getting a little bit theoretical and conspiratorial with you guys. I hope that's okay. Uh, I don't do that too often, but... That's my personal opinion. Let me know what you guys think. Those are just some comments of mine. But, uh, yeah, these people want to stay in power for sure. But we're, we're looking at this here in Myanmar. Um, Australia monitors global internet tra traffic. Back to the article. So, yeah, they're talking about Myanmar losing internet. Nobody dared go out. Nobody knew what was happening on the next street or what was happening in another township. Right, so people couldn't come together. We couldn't communicate with each other anymore, and people totally freaked out. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Yep, and I believe they successfully took power, right? Yeah, mass arrests. Uh, I believe they had other examples of different countries that went through this. Uh, Burma or Burmese. Okay. Okay, here we go. Yeah, the situation in Myanmar is not unique. Other countries, including India, Ethiopia, Belarus, Venezuela, have used internet shutdowns as a method of crushing dissent and obfuscating the truth. Uh, the internet as a tool of knowledge, sharing, connection, and bottom-up democracy is being bludgeoned with an off switch. Yes, and I suspect that's going to happen. The first major precursor to today's internet shutdowns was the Arab Spring. Starting in December 2010, as people across North Africa and the Middle East rose against authoritarian rulers, the internet emerged on the world stage as a force for political mobilization. Yes, and that's what we saw in 2016. That's why Trump got elected. The great meme wars of 2016, right? Because the libs can't meme. They're not that funny. Uh, and so, you know, the conservatives, they came out and, you know, had a good time. Trump was having a lot of good energy being put out there. And so a lot of people rallied around him. If it wasn't for the internet... Trump probably would have not been elected, right? And so um, the great meme wars, that's what won the election back in 2016. And also a lot of people getting banned off these, you know, leftist social media sites that also further invigorated people. And so, yes, the Internet was very much used in ways never before in politics to inspire an international populist movement. And they're not going to let that happen again. I don't think that they're ever going to let that happen again, which is why we said a few minutes ago they're going to shut it off if it ever uh, starts to get like that again. In my opinion, that's what I theorize. Uh, protest movements were hashed in Facebook groups, spotlighted on Twitter, chronicled on YouTube, etc. Right. Right. So, yeah, you're looking at Libya here, and now we're looking at Egypt. And, yeah, you could go down all this stuff. But this is interesting, right? This is interesting stuff. And this could happen in the future. And maybe they don't even have to enforce a shutdown of the Internet because what we're about to get to with issues with the electricity grid, this could be uh, something which just happens automatically because the Internet is a derivative of the electricity grid. If you can't access electricity, then you obviously lose Internet access. So they go into a lot of detail here. You can read all that. But... Let's get on to the next article here. Right, so furious Europeans protest electricity hyperinflation. 
well, why are they having hyperinflation? Golly, could it be because you think that you could replace oil and gas, which is the most concentrated, reliable, and easily accessible form of energy in the entire universe, right? You think you can replace that with solar and wind turbines? Uh, no, no. It, it's a scheme to pay off their friends. You guys remember uh, Solyndra here in the United States? It was a total scam. Uh, they got like $100 million from the government, ended up being a total scam. Maybe they got like a couple billion dollars now that I think about it. But yeah, it's a total scam. And so we could go into all the problems with renewable energy the rare earth minerals which have to be mined out of the ground which are totally environmentally not friendly uh you look at teslas which are supposed to be environmentally friendly many reports have come out and said no they're actually not we don't know how to recycle these materials uh you need all of these special uh minerals to go into these things which are hard to get out of the ground you have to cause a whole lot of environmental pollution in order to make these things so it's a scam it's a scheme and you know you can't really trust the scientists nowadays when it comes to this stuff and just to add one little thing, a recommendation, we're not going to dig too much into this, but go check out James Corbett. Uh, he's done a lot of good work. He's banned off YouTube now. Obviously, he's a good listen to <laughs> then in that case. But like he talks about how the, the climate change people, uh, for the most part, are the same people who were behind the eugenics movement back in the early 20th century. Um, he connects a lot of dots. He looks at the Rockefeller Foundation. He looks at a lot of people uh, who are part of this, uh, you know, scientific scheme to control population. And it's the same kind of deal, right? They want to use climate as a way to control the public. And just notice how the climate movement is never about expanding freedom. It's never about, oh, well, we have a climate crisis, therefore we have to limit the power of the government. It's like, no, 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 no. They're all about using this as a way to justify bigger and bigger government. And who funds these scientists, by the way? Well, the government, right? And a lot of these scientists, they have to go through like eight years of school. And what happens at these schools? Well, a lot of indoctrination into government theology, right? So that is something to consider. And, you know, they've changed the scheme from global cooling to then global warming. But when it only warmed like one degree in 50 years, then it was like, OK, well, we're just going to call it climate change. And it's like, of course, the climate changes. Right. It's always changed. That's that's the deal. But you can't control that to try to control a complex system with millions upon millions of interdependent variables which influence each other in ways that you can't possibly comprehend because it's just information overload. You're talking about a complex system. Well, you know, that's that's tough. That's really tough, right? You never know what's going to happen. And so same thing with economy, same thing with all this stuff. I mean, economists are the least, uh, you know, you have weathermen who can't even predict the weather two days from now right? But we have climatologists who are telling you where things are going 50 years from now, 100 years from now, right? Same thing with economists. Economists have been wrong forever. And so you can't really predict how complex systems evolve. And so what, now we're going to have the government lock down the entire planet? And you've seen articles like this come out. They're like, the bug crisis has taught us a lot about how it is we could approach climate change. And you saw Justin Trudeau say this same thing. He's like, we've learned a lot over the last couple of years. And really, we're thinking about using some of the met methods that we've used in order to address climate change, right? Lockdowns, uh, less usage of automobiles because less people are traveling because more people are in their homes, more people are working from home. And in Australia, you can only go like 10... Uh, you know, miles from your house or something like this. Maybe it's even smaller than that. And so, again, it's a way to control the population, in my opinion. Uh, and nobody ever looks at the central banks who print trillions upon trillions of dollars, which essentially just means you're taking demand out of the future to spend it now. That's the nature of debt. It's, uh, you know, consuming future uh, production in the moment and then paying it back in the future with future production, Right. And so that is in and of itself unsustainable, and that's sponsored by the central banks, but now you have the central banks sponsoring these ESG initiatives in order to encourage people to lower their climate and to set climate goals. And the ECB has come out and said, oh, well, if you're not going to go along with these ESG uh, regulations, and if you're not going to go along with this new initiative to go along with the Paris Climate Accord and all these things in order to cut our carbon footprint, 
well, we're not going to buy your bonds, which essentially is a death sentence in Europe because all the corporations, they're like these zombie corporations which can't pay their own debts unless they have more debt come in. It's a giant Ponzi scheme, right? And so then they fail. And so now the, the central banks are moving in on this. Anyways, not to go on too long of a rant. I probably have been ranting for like five minutes, but let's just go into this, right? You're starting to see hyperinflation in electricity prices, right? Right? And so here we go. Uh, soaring natural gas prices threaten to become a drag on the economies of Europe and elsewhere. Wholesale prices for the fuel are at the highest in years, nearly five times where they were this time in 2019. Right. The high costs feed into electric power prices and have begun to show up in utility bills, weighing on consumers whose personal finances have already been sustained or restrained by the pandemic. The price jumps are unusual because demand is typically relatively low in the warmer summer months, raising alarms about the prospects for further increases when demand jumps in the winter. Right. And so think of it. If you're a Bitcoin miner... Or if you are someone mining cryptocurrency, this is not going to be very profitable for you. That's going to definitely cut into your margins. And if we could expect this in the future, if we could expect higher on average electricity prices, and you have the halving of cryptocurrency going on into the future for the mining of cryptocurrency and some of these proof-of-work blockchains, right? Well, that's going to even be more stressful for a lot of individual small-time mining operations. Right. And so that's going to encourage more centralization in some of these uh, cryptocurrency projects, particularly Bitcoin, in my opinion. And so, yeah, more people are going to be squeezed out of the market. More centralization is going to occur as a result of this, in my opinion, because this is not going to um, this is not going to be a one off thing, in my opinion. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But this is happening all over Europe. Putting the recent price surge into context, Spanish households are paying roughly 40% more than what they paid for electricity a year ago, as the wholesale price has more than doubled, prompting angry protests against utility companies. Uh, yeah. Yeah, power prices are another front page story. It's a, it's a political problem. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. People are angry about this. Yeah, everybody wants alternative solar and wind until they finally get it, and then they don't have energy and they can't afford all the niceties of the civilization that they're once comfortable in. Okay, yeah, here we go. The pain is being felt across Europe. Right, so I, I just want to communicate to you guys that this is not something which is out of the picture. And I know that we have some European listeners who are tuning in right now, um, and you know what I'm talking about here. Right, and it's going to get cold here. We're not in the winter yet. Amusingly, the jump has prompted some to call for an acceleration of the shift from fossil fuels to clean domestic energy sources like wind and solar power. Never let a crisis go to waste to free consumers from being at the mercy of global commodities markets. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, here we go. This is, of course, dead wrong because with the ongoing green shift across the developed world, existing utilities are mothballing capacity expansions in baseload facilities meaning that prices will soar much higher until the green regime is established. This could take place in five years or 50. Yeah, we don't know how long this is going to take. In order to build this new green infrastructure, you're going to need oil. You're going to need electricity. You're going to need copper. You're going to need commodities. And so, you know, if you're already seeing this now, and who knows how far through this green revolution we are, it could be 50 years because, you know, you have crazy people in Congress, at least in the United States, saying that we want to remodel every single building in the United States I mean, you know, who knows? Who knows? Right? The turbulence in price may also be a harbinger of volatility if energy companies begin to give up on fossil fuel production before renewable sources are ready to pick up the slack. Right, right. And it's just weird. You, you are going to see this. Because we live in such a comfortable civilization, or at least we did before 2019, nobody had really anything to do. There was no enemy to really fight. And so people always want to pick up some kind of cause that they can fight for. You know what I mean? And so what does that mean? Well, you pick an enemy, or at least your elites pick an enemy for you, which is the oil companies. You guys are ruining the oceans. You guys are ruining this and that, which means we have to 
pay a bunch of miners to dig a bunch of stuff out of the ground and ruin these habitats instead of these habitats. You know, resources always have to come from somewhere, ladies and gentlemen. And so while I'm not totally bearish on solar uh, and wind, I think that there are developments to be made. I think that having a solar panel in my house would be great because you don't have to rely so much on the system. I'm not saying it's all bad. Let me just be clear. But, yeah, I mean, you have these crazy people who think that we can just cut ourselves from fossil fuels right now and we'd be totally fine. We can just use solar and wind. And, like, do you know how crazy that is? Like, to not understand the intricacies of the global energy markets and how a civilization functions on fossil fuels and then say, in a position of power like AOC, we need to get rid of fossil fuels. This is killing our planet. It's just like, okay, well, do you want to kill the entirety of human like civilization? Because that's what you're going to do if you get rid of fossil fuels right now. <laughs> like, that's no joke. Do not mess with our energy infrastructure. That's not a good idea. Um, and so, yeah, natural gas prices are going up. With supplies coming by pipeline from Russia and to a lesser extent Algeria and Libya. Right, and they're going to blame Putin. And we've talked about Gazprom a little bit here on the channel. Uh, go check out Gazprom. That is the uh, the creator of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is going to be integral for the future energy that Europe has. Um, now that Joe Biden gave up the leverage and has allowed Russia to continue on the uh, completion on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Now Russia has a lot of capacity to influence European politics. And so why did he do that? We'll never know, but he did. And everyone's like, oh, Trump is a Russian agent, even though he prevented Nord Stream 2 from passing during the four years of his administration, which kept Europe uh, very much into the camp of the United States. And now they're shifting to Eurasia, which was kind of inevitable anyway, but it's just an interesting thing to note. Uh, and so, yes, there are more things going on here. You could read into all that stuff. So whatever reason behind electricity hyperinflation, we suggest that the ECB and Christine Lagarde pay close attention to staple electricity prices. Yeah, they're going to send inflation expectations up pretty fast. And we already have inflation going on. And by the way, this is going to go global. This isn't just going to stick to Europe. We have the same thing going on here. And we'll get to that here in this article. Uh, the European energy crisis is about to go global. This was written in early September. Things are still pretty bad in Europe. Uh, they expected to actually go forth into the winter, which would be pretty bad, right? But here we go. European natural gas and electricity prices are unlikely to ease in the coming months ahead of what could be a costly winter season for stressed out consumers. The price increases for natural gas and power are unusual for this time of year raising concerns that prices will remain sticky and eat away wages. Well, that's probably not what you want right now. But just keep the money printer burned, bruh. Nat gas prices hit a record high last month due to slowing Russian supply, causing a crunch on the continent. Right, so they're very dependent on Russia. Then the lack of wind-driven electricity production forced European utility companies to fire up nat gas turbines to satisfy electricity shortfalls. And guys, just remember... All this is very, very bearish, the uranium sector, nuclear energy. And we're going to get to that here in a little bit. We're going to go over it briefly. This episode underlies the precarious state of the continent's energy markets ahead winter. Again, guys, don't, don't just cavalierly comment on global energy markets. You're talking about the fundamental basis of civilization. And so when you're talking with somebody about climate change and how we need to get rid of fossil fuels, just like ask them, it's like, are you sure you know what you're talking about? <laughs> like, if you're in a position of power, would you cut off fossil fuels right now? Are you insane? <laughs> you know, just follow up with these questions, right? Because I don't think a lot of people understand the integral importance of this stuff. Uh, you're messing with the fundamental forces of reality and human life okay so the price shock has been most evident in the uk as the country learns a valuable lesson about relying on wind farms electricity prices have more than doubled in september and were seven times higher than the same month in 2020 yeah and with wind and solar you could have cloudy days you could have days that are not so windy and so you don't have that reliability that you do with fossil fuels so yeah power prices are continuing to soar and natural gas is being strained. 
And something else to just note, we're pretty bull bullish on Russian and Arabian energy. And if you look into the climate change movement, you will find a lot of Russian and Arabian money. Just something for you to look into. It's true. And why do they want to do that? Well, it causes uh, more social pressure on Western oil companies. And so that encourages more political pressure to be placed against those Western oil companies, which means more regulation, which means more costs that they have to pay to explore, to drill, to extract. And so that means that they could be priced out of the market when it comes to people like Russia and OPEC who can get it out for much cheaper. They don't have as many regulations, largely because their economies rely more on oil. And so it's good for them if the Americans are priced out more, if the Europeans are priced out more, um, because it allows their economy to benefit that much more. So just consider that. Uh, this stuff is interesting. So now we're going to get to this article. The European energy crisis is about to go global. It was only a matter of time. In a globalized world, energy crunches can hardly remain regionally contained for very long, especially in a context of damaged supply chains and a rush to cut investment in fossil fuels. And speaking of supply chains, guys, you may want to get your Christmas presents now because the supply chains, from what I hear, is not getting better. Uh, they're getting worse, actually. The energy crunch that began in Europe earlier this month, and also get some food. <laughs> I've been reading some things. Uh, may now be on its way to America. For now, all is well with one of the world, world's top... Sorry, this website is glitchy. They got a lot of ads. For now, all is well with one of the world's top gas producers. U.S. gas exporters have enjoyed a solid increase in demand from Asia and Europe as the recovering economic activity pushed demand for electricity higher. Uh, coal exports are on the rise too. Yeah, we're exporting some coal, which is good. Coal inventories are running low because of stronger exports with prices for thermal coal three times higher than they were a year ago. Right. Electricity prices are already going up. Um, yeah, so... Hold on. There's a key point I wanted to catch here. Okay, let's just continue. An alarming move such intervention was requested last week by Manufacturing Industry Group. Industrial Energy Consumers for America, an organization representing companies producing chemicals, food, materials, as Department of Energy to institute limits on the exports of liquefied natural gas in order to avoid soaring prices and gas shortages during the winter. Right, So you have people now saying, hey, we should stop shipping out our commodities. We should stop shipping out our goods right now because we may need this for ourselves. And so that is interesting to consider. Opinions seem to differ on whether rising LNG exports are in fact hurting U.S. consumers. But the fact is that gas prices are already double what they were a year ago. And, you know, of course, we had to shut down the Keystone Pipeline for whatever reason. And so uh, it's interesting. It's like a few months ago, Biden was trying to encourage other international oil producers to increase their output of oil after he had shut down the Keystone Pipeline and had hindered our own capacity to be oil independent and produce our own oil to lower our own oil prices, because he was concerned about inflation. He was concerned about oil prices, especially after the uh, colonial pipeline attack. We couldn't uh, handle that issue ourselves. We couldn't pump our own oil and lower our own gas prices. We have to rely on the Arabians now. Isn't that great? Again, who is behind this guy? Uh, LNG industry is, of course, against this. Yeah, so you can dig into the details there. But, yeah, they're saying that uh, this could get pretty bad in the winter. Now we'll see what happens. Here we go. Here's our favorite oil company, Gazprom. Right. So I think Gazprom's going to be key here in the future. It's done pretty well over the last few months. Just something to keep on y'all's radar. So here's something interesting. Now we're going to get to the Chinese story of this. China energy crunch. The electricity shortages in China are worsening and widening geographically. It's getting so bad, Beijing is now asking some food processors like soybean crushing plants to shut down. Uh, and I said, at least they're kind enough to give the Bitcoin miners a forewarning to go somewhere else. Right. 
And if you're a Bitcoin miner, again, just consider this, guys. What are the extra costs going to be for people who mine Bitcoin and the people who need to access their Bitcoin? Because these quote-unquote stores of value in cryptocurrency, it relies on quite a few layers of things working properly. It relies on a few layers of infrastructure. Like you need electricity, you need internet. And if these things are going up in value in order to access, well, it's going to get more expensive to access your store of value. And the store of value should just be like right there in your hand. You should have it, in my opinion. And when it comes to the philosophy of a store of value, you want something which doesn't depreciate, something which is cheap to access, something which you could readily access and use. Um that's not the case that you're going to see with crypto moving here into the future if this kind of activity continues, um, which is why we're bullish uranium. Uh, the world definitely needs more nuclear reactors. And we're going to talk about small modular reactors, which are on the rise. A lot of American and Japanese investment that's going to become critical over the next, I think, 50 years for the energy infrastructure of the world. And somebody was nice enough to comment on our video asking about thorium reactors. I think thorium reactors... Uh, are pretty interesting. Bill Gates is investing in thorium reactors, uh, but you're going to have to do a big overhaul of the entire nuclear energy infrastructure in order for that to become uh, something which is done on a wide basis. And because of the cost of doing that and because of the marginal increase in efficiency using thorium versus uranium, people are just going to continue to use uranium because it's still reasonably efficient to use given the infrastructure that we have relative to thorium. So I think that is what is going on. That's why you pick uranium. Uh, I think it's a pretty good play. But you've got that, and now we've got China enforces power rationing at major industrial hubs amid shortages and climate push. And so who knows? Maybe this is part of the Great Reset. Maybe this is part of population control, limiting the amount of energy that people could have access to. Because, again, I'm not convinced of this whole climate thing. And just, I am a conservationist. I love nature. You guys love my nature videos. I love being in nature. I want a clean environment. But that's not to say that we have a climate issue that is going to be apocalyptic if we continue our way of life now. I mean, the biggest concern that I have is peak oil. Not having enough oil to move into the future and not having enough oil to sustain operations, which I think nuclear energy is really interesting. But um, not to get too much into the, client, the climate science here, uh, I've studied this for a few hundred hours. Uh, I was really interested in this back when I was a teenager, and I was once somebody who thought that, yeah, the world is going to end. We need to just start eating vegetables. We need to stop eating meat. I saw that uh, documentary, Cowspiracy. I don't know if you guys remember that, where they were comparing the amount of water and the amount of emissions, which uh, they were comparing the amount of water and the amount of land, which is used to grow a certain amount of meat relative to growing certain amounts of vegetables and the carbon emissions from each. And it didn't make meat look really good. And so it encouraged this whole wave of people to become vegans to try to save the earth and everything like this, even though veganism literally is a very unhealthy diet. I'm not going to get into that either. Um, but if you look into history and you see 500 million years ago, what our parts per million for carbon were in the atmosphere, it was like 4,500. Um, and that's when you had the Precambrian explosion of life, which was the biggest explosion of biodiverse life ever in history, uh, geological history. And now we're at, I believe, 400 parts per million, something like this. And from what I understand, based on the science, if we fell below 200 parts per million, because you, remember, plants use carbon to facilitate photosynthesis, if the parts per million fell below 200, which it was doing before humans came along with the Industrial Revolution and kind of stopped that from happening. Well, plants may not have been able to facilitate photosynthesis, right? And that would have been a problem. And it looks like with the Industrial Revolution, all the carbon going into the atmosphere, that stopped that from happening. The parts per million is increasing in the environment. And I'm not in the atmosphere. I'm not saying that isn't happening. Of course, it's happening. Um, but I'm not thinking 
that it's going to introduce this greenhouse effect that's going to start a positive feedback loop, which is then going to end with the ice caps melting and the entire world being flooded. That is the climatological catastrophist case, which is being made. I don't think the earth works that way. I don't think the earth works that way. All self-regulating systems, self-organizing systems, have certain checks and balances, which make it so that nothing really just goes into a tailspin into total catastrophe and death like that. There are always, there's always a homeostasis. There's always, well, they, some people call it homeodynamics because there's always, you know, a sort of give and take in a dance that goes on on what they call the edge of chaos um, to a balance point, to a balance point. Nature is always trying to look for balance and homeostasis and uh, some kind of mean, right? And so it's not like we lose order and then we go into chaos forever. That's not the case. And it's not like the banks are acting as if this is true because if you buy like a condo on the coast, and Dan Pena talks about this, if you buy like a condo on the coast or a house on the coast, uh, you can't get an insurance policy for climate change. You can't say that, hey, if in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, you know, there's a rise in the seat levels because the ice caps are flooding or whatever, uh, you need to protect against this. Like, there's no investor prospectus that says this. There's no insurance policies for this uh, because they don't believe it. I don't think they believe it. It's all part of, uh, you know, getting along with the political advancements and movements of the time, right? And so... Those are just some comments I have on that. I'd like to hear y'all's comments. I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong, but this is just what my research has led me to believe. I think it's just part of this eugenics push and this idea that there is some invisible uber-goober monster out there, some boogaloo that we need to uh, be afraid of, and so the government needs to come in and save us from that threat. And it's the same thing which happened in 2020 with this bug that ended up not being nearly as bad as everyone thought it was. Make everyone scared of an invisible thing they can't see, taste, or touch, and then have the government assume more control. That is what I see with the climate movement and the climate situation. Okay, so again, comments on that. I could be wrong. Tell me I'm wrong if you think I'm wrong. That's fine. Let's have a discussion about this. I don't have a monopoly on truth, right? But... Back to this, uh, a perfect storm for increased power demand and the calls to reduce carbon emissions has resulted in power rationing across China. Power curves are being forced onto major factory hubs in more than 10 provinces. Yes, local governments have ordered power cuts to meet carbon emission rules following the country's top economic planner, outlining how economic rebounds in the year's first half resulted in high carbon emissions in nine provinces. The Business Herald reported soaring coal prices are causing pain for the power plants that have reduced power output, creating electricity supply gaps in some provinces. If those gaps are persistent through the winter season, larger power curtailments could be ahead. Again, just read all this and understand all this in the context of cryptocurrency because crypto requires electricity. Crypto requires internet. So just keep all this in mind. Kayakson reports, Zhejiang that the government ordered at least 160 energy-intensive companies to suspend operations to reduce carbon emissions. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. And China's kind of last to the party, right? Uh, they've been the least concerned about climate, while the entire world has been uh, deindustrializing to a major degree and have been curbing their own economic outputs in order to accommodate for climate goals. China has not. And, you know, you go to Shanghai, you go to Beijing, there's just like smog everywhere in the air, air you can barely breathe. Like even before the book, people were walking around with masks all the time because the air was hard to breathe. And this is a part of industrialization. Uh, but yeah, they didn't really care. They were taking advantage. They were taking advantage of the world deindustrializing. They continued to pollute and uh, have a lot of economic activity, right? Power cuts were also issued across 14 cities. Uh, power suppliers will spare no effort to keep providing electricity to residents, hospitals, schools, radio, TV communications, transportation hubs, and other important users. Well, that's okay, good, that they are prioritizing that. But, uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. This is interesting stuff. 
This all comes as carbon emissions have been soaring in the country this year as it increases the use of coal-fired plants amid the economic rebound. Yep. So, again, think of that in the context of crypto. How expensive is it going to be to mine crypto? And how expensive is it going to be to thereby use crypto? Things to think about. Things to think about, ladies and gentlemen. And so I'm not saying that this negates crypto's use as a store of value. I think that it's still going to be rather cheap to use cryptos like Monero. Because remember, we were talking to Arctic Mine about dynamic block size and tail emission, uh, which both play hand in hand together. And so as transaction volume goes up, it actually gets cheaper to transact. And so uh, I think it's still going to be relatively cheap to use these cryptocurrencies, even if the price goes up, maybe fees goes up to accommodate for the higher electricity costs. But I do believe that this poses risks for having these things as stores of value, which is why I think you should hedge. I, I, like when it comes to gold and silver, the reason why gold and silver typically go up as oil goes up is one, because when oil goes up, that cuts into the profits of gold and silver miners that disincentivizes them to continue operations and continuing to open up new operations because they want to wait for oil prices to go down, cuts into margins and stuff like that, right? But when you have gold and silver, it's sort of like you have in your hand uh, literally proof of work right there. I mean, this, it's an investment of used energy in your hand. And... That is not really the case with cryptocurrency because you still have to remind on, you have to, you have to, what's the word? You have to rely on miners into the future in order to mine your crypto for you. Like you holding crypto, you are relying on the infrastructure to continue to work into the future. When you hold gold and silver, it's there. It's there. You can just give it to somebody cool. It's value right there. No extra work has to be done except you have to be alive or whatever, right? But that is to be considered as Lebanon's electric grid collapses. Dozens of hospital patients could die due to lack of power. And again, we've read this before, so I'm going to briefly go over this. Failed states have failed electric grids. Nowhere is that true right now than Lebanon. Right. And so they're teetering on the edge of collapse. They can barely afford to keep the hospitals up. And so are people going to be able to afford to mine Bitcoin? Are people going to afford to be able to use cryptocurrency in this environment? Just something to think about. And people could say, and I've heard this response before, they're like, oh, well, if they use Bitcoin in the first place, they wouldn't run into this mess. Well, maybe, maybe not, maybe not. I mean, if you get into a war situation, that's going to have implications for the electric grid. And that could happen. That could definitely be coming to the United States. And that could definitely be coming to Europe because of mass migration from the third world. You know, I mean, you're importing people from all over the world. Now we're importing people from Haiti, uh, who I believe, or maybe that's not them, but some people in Africa think that, uh, you know, if you are a little pale skinned, you're like a witch doctor and you need to be killed. Like people have crazy beliefs. And when you mix people together who have crazy belief systems uh, or at least differing belief systems throughout history, that hasn't really worked. That hasn't really worked. And that increases the potential for conflict. I think everyone can agree to that. Uh, when you have heterogeneous cultural mixture in a particular place, um, that leads to a higher likelihood of conflict than if you had a homogenous culture, right? I think that is historically proven. But that being said, even if you do have an economy run on crypto and you do have things that are you know, quite well, uh, running in the realm of commerce, that is not a guarantee for peace. That is not a guarantee for peace because, again, of cultural mixture. But that said, that said, um, the reality is they didn't have a crypto-based economy. They didn't have a crypto-based economy. And based on our past videos, it looks like, yeah, we could have a crypto-based economy, but it's going to be run by central banks still because they're going to have the central bank digital currencies. If you look at the Money Today show, they're going to have an infrastructure for blockchain that's going to become interoperable central bank digital currencies when they roll out. And so our dream of crypto taking over, Monero taking over, uh, it's going to be a long fight. Like it's not going to be an easy fight, guys. I hope that you guys understand this. Uh, I think that 
if we educate people, I think that we can get people into these positions and we could start to build these networks because I think it clicks for people. When you show them information like this, when you expose them to the threat of what we could be going into as far as like a Huxley and Brave New World or an Orwellian 1984 world where everything is tracked and traced and censored and everything like this, well, you can easily incentivize people to get into things like Monero and build a community together of freedom-loving people. I think that is the goal here. And notice I didn't, I didn't say anything about privacy. Privacy plays into it, but ultimately it's about getting ourselves out of this situation. And that said, that said, I think it's good to recommend people also have backup wealth. You know, I, I'm having a hard time believing that a lot of people in the crypto community are spending their wealth that they've made in crypto on NFTs. <laughs> like digital real estate. Okay, Bill Gates is literally buying up all the farmland in the United States. He owns like hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland. And BlackRock's buying up a lot of the residential real estate. And it's hard for me to believe that we, the crypto bros, who love freedom and want liberty, aren't going toe-to-toe with those guys to try to set up our own community infrastructure. Like it's again all about getting rich, all about the gains. It's not. It's not about these higher goals that we have for freedom, because if it was, a lot of the crypto bros, a lot of the people who have made a lot of money would be buying land. You know, they'd be maybe setting up their own Bitcoin mining operations if they really cared about Bitcoin not becoming centralized. They'd be doing all these things rather than you know pumping prices on the internet. So, I think that. Because of where everything is going, I think that it's important for you guys. Excuse me. I've been having too many of these Chick-fil-A cookies. I think it's important for you guys to take a look at this stuff. And I think that is it. I've been rambling here for about an hour, so that's pretty good content, right? But yeah, take a look at this stuff and just consider it. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to spread fear. We talk about love and light and God and Christ all the time here on the channel. Don't give in to fear. I see a lot of that on my YouTube and a lot of that on my Twitter, uh, people looking at things going on in Australia. And I'm not saying do not be aware of that, but don't let it get you angry. Don't let it get you in fear, okay? Speak the truth, act righteously, and Christ will come to our aid and we will be able to overcome tyranny just as we have throughout the last like 2,000 years, right? Look at the Soviet Union. Look at Hungary. These countries always make their way out of tyranny, and they make their way to Christ again. I assure you that if we stay with Christ, and we continue to act intelligently and rationally, as our forefathers did in our civilization, we will make it through this. I am very hopeful and positive about that. Very hopeful and positive about that. So let me leave you with a positive message, that being said, and take all this into account. Think about uranium. I didn't talk too much about that as much as I wanted to, but I think with everything we've seen here... Uh, I think uranium is going to be key, and Americans and Japanese uh, governments are investing in this stuff, even though there is a big campaign to uh, make it look dangerous because of Fukushima, and just note that is a risk, that is a risk. If you see another meltdown, like you saw with Japan and Fukushima, there could be another uh, campaign to stop nuclear because it's bad for the environment, because of the fallout and things like this. Too, it's too risky, you know, um, so that's, again, something to hedge against. Uh, by just getting involved with Eastern oil companies, again, like we talked about. So that's all for this video. I hope that you got some information and good takes from it. Uh, I know that we rambled a lot about climate change and things like this. That's becoming more prominent in the narrative and in the social conversation out there. But I wanted to give my take on it. Again, I'm not a minister of truth. I'm somebody who has studied this stuff as a layman. So uh, let me know if you have a different take. I'm not trying to... Uh, misguide people. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, uh, you know, secretly and surreptitiously enact my death wish for the planet or something like this, right? I'm just trying to give you an honest take. So let me know what you guys think. Monero Mateo, check out the links below, the social media links. Gab, Telegram, Twitter, Odyssey. Uh, check me out on Podbean. We have the podcast up there if you want the MP3 downloads, which is great. And then uh, donate at the address below, the crypto address below. And that would be really helpful to me. 
Check us out on Patreon, last but not least, and become a patron. That'd be really helpful. So with that said, you guys have a great night. You guys have a great day. God bless.